All right, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you being with us in the house of God tonight. Thank you to those that are watching via the live stream or watching later on YouTube. Hope tonight will be a blessing as we wrap up uh, our discussion tonight about the millennium. Uh, like I said, there was a, a couple of questions asked in relation to that, so we're going to try to answer those questions tonight. But to kind of take a, last week we kind of took a, a look at, you know, why the millennium is even found in Scripture and, and, and who's going to be in the millennium and those kind of things. Tonight we're going to be looking specifically at some of the details about some of the events or how things will be during the millennium. And so uh, we'll uh, jump right into that here in just a moment. And then uh, depending on the time, uh, I think I have finally settled out on wh which side of the equation I fall out on on when the Old Testament saints are raptured or, or resurrected. I won't say raptured, but resurrected. And uh, so if we have time, I'll get into that tonight too. Uh, but if, we, if, if this goes a little longer, then I, we'll wait to another day. <laughs> but, but I spent a lot of time after I got this done, I spent a lot of time digging and reading and praying and looking and cross-referencing Scripture and all kinds of things. And I've, there's, Actually, believe it or not, it's ironic, but it's a New Testament verse that, as I was thinking about it studying, it's a New Testament verse that gave me the peace about what happens. Uh, even though it's talking about, the, uh, even though the question is around the Old Testament saints, it's actually a New Testament verse. And so, like I said, if we get to it, we'll get to it. If not, we'll cover it another day. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into the lesson tonight. All right, Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity you give us to be in your house. Thank you for uh, each and every person that made it out tonight, those that are watching via the live stream or watching even later on on YouTube. Father, I pray again that tonight will be a blessing as we try to wrap up this little piece of the puzzle uh, here on prophecy and begin to prepare for uh, some of the later topics that we're looking at. So, Father, I pray that you just have your way tonight. Use me, bring back to my mind the things that I've studied, and we'll just give you the praise and glory for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. So, like I said, last time we began our look at the millennium, uh, and, or the millennial kingdom, or sometimes called the Messianic kingdom, because Christ, as the Messiah of the Jews, will be ruling. Uh, and we talked about, you know, Christ we've, uh, as the king, of kings and lord of lords we've talked about the passages uh, some of the passages that relate to uh, david the prince and you know i'm fully convinced i mean if i'm if i'm going to be resurrected or raptured and i get to rule and reign i don't have a good real good reason for saying david won't get to uh, and so, so from that standpoint i think it really is david um and uh, we talked about that uh keep in mind and this will be very important as we look continue to look at this tonight that uh, while we as the uh, resurrected, raptured church, those that are um, uh, saved through tribulation, the Bible says, because they don't take the mark of the beast and all of those kind of things, we will have glorified bodies. You know, we won't um, age or anything else. But remember that the judgment of the nations is what determines who gets into the kingdom. And these will be flesh and blood people. All right? Uh, and so uh, that's a key to understanding a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight. These are uh, the, the people in the kingdom uh, are actually flesh and blood just like we are. They will be having children during that time. And I got to thinking about something, and, and you talk about an interesting little spin. We'll, again, we'll talk about it as we go. But remember, the millennial kingdom is part of the whole end times uh, uh, timeline that we've talked about. You have the rapture. Then you have the tribulation. At the midpoint, the Antichrist sets himself up, sets up the uh, uh, abomination of desolation in the temple uh, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and then at, from the midpoint to the end of the, uh, from the midpoint to the end of the seven years is the great tribulation, where the Bible says it has never been like anything before. Uh, then at the end of that, you have the return of Christ at the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, and then after the battle of Armageddon, you have the judgment of the nations and then the establishment of the millennial reign. So this is what we're talking about with the millennial kingdom or the Messianic kingdom or the millennial reign, uh, the millennium, all of it's the same thing. We're just, sometimes I'll flip terminology depending on what I'm talking about, but we're still talking about the same event. Now, to do this, we're going to be talking about what's going on on the earth during the millennial kingdom, okay? 
Uh, and to sum it up, and this is kind of the easiest way to just start, to sum it up, the millennial kingdom will be an unparalleled time of blessing and change. A lot of things are going to be going on. The first thing that we can see is that it'll be a time of, of righteousness and justice and peace. The Bible says in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountain, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Of course, this is Christ, speaking of him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. This is where that famous phrase, and, and like I said, I think it's actually on the cornerstone of uh, the uh, United Nations, uh, this particular verse. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. That part of the verse is actually on the cornerstone. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. So what we see from this passage, and I'm going to say this up front, I'm giving you one or two verses just to show you the, the big flow here. If you really want to, if you really get into a study of the millennium, there is passage after passage after passage of Scripture that deals with this. As I said last time, if you look at the Old Testament prophets, almost all of them spend at least a portion, if not a large portion, of their prophecies talking about the events in the millennium. Okay, so this is a huge deal. And like I said, it's, un it's unfortunate in a way that you don't hear much in churches about it, considering it is such a major part of the Old Testament and, again, of prophecy. But So I'm just giving you really, really short snippets of verses. Uh, I was reading one of my systematic theologies as I was putting together this series, or this particular lesson, and, and I'm going to see if I can find this book on archive.net. That's a website where you can download old books that are out of print. And he mentioned this one particular book, and it's just on the Millennial Kingdom. He said it is 2,100 pages long, 750-ish words a page. Now, think, just think about that for a minute, about how much information this guy has pulled together on the millennium straight from Scripture. And then he said the same gentleman, this was in the early 1900s, I'm not like 1920, uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer, uh, and <clears throat> he made the comment, he said, on the one hand, you have this gentleman, 2,100 pages, 750 words a page, uh, and, and, and he said in that book, I'm scratching the surface. <laughs> I, if that's the case, I'm not even beginning to scratch anything. But, but he said, I'm scratching the surface. He said, then he heard another professor teach that you could, everything you could need to know about the millennium, you could learn in 15 minutes. So needless to say, he was not real happy with the other guy. Uh, but as, so like I said, I was studying all of this, and, and so there's verse after verse after verse, passage after passage. I actually at one point thought I had the bright idea that I would give you a list of all the verses in the Old Testament that deal with the millennial kingdom. I ain't got that kind of time. Uh, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure if I would have turned and looked and Googled enough, I might find somebody that's already done it. But, uh, but, but like I said, the majority of the Old Testament prophets touch on this at least a little, if not a lot. And so it would, it's really difficult to kind of do that. But anyway, the first thing we see here is that uh, it's a time of unparalleled blessing. Isaiah chapter number 11, verse number 4, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, this is why I said it's so important to understand that the people who are in the millennium, the flesh and blood people, they are flesh and blood people. Satan is bound for a thousand years. But the people who enter the kingdom still have their sin nature. And there's still some of them are still going to bow up. There's going to be wickedness in places. And what the Bible tells us is, is that Jesus, whether it's, whether it's him directly or through us as his representatives or whatever, is going to deal with sin immediately. But when it comes to 
nations sinning against him or against whatever, then it says he rules with this rod of his mouth, or as it says in Revelation 9.15, that he rules with a rod of iron. And that's why he rules with this rod of iron. It is because people still have that sin nature. Satan may not be there to stir it up, but the Bible says we fight the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life internally. And that won't go away just because Satan is bound for a thousand years. So the people in the millennium, those who are entering because they passed through the judgment of the judgment of nations, they're still going to have the sin nature. They're still going to be having children. And guess what? Those children are still going to have the sin nature. So we have to understand that when we talk about it. Uh, if everything was perfect, he wouldn't need that rod of iron. I mean, that's what it amounts to. So here's what Zechariah 14 tells us about this, about him ruling with a rod of iron. And this is Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 19. And it shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will, or whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that, ha uh, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So notice that. Nations, even though you have a perfect king in a very near perfect world, will refuse to come worship that perfect king. They'll bow up. They'll rebel. And when they do that, God shuts off the rain, just like he did in the days of Elijah. Or he sends the plagues, just like he did in the days of Egypt, to get their attention. So like I said, it's a near-perfect world, except for the unperfect people that are still there, is really what it amounts to. And, and some people question, like I said, why will people rebel against Christ if Satan and the demons are bound for that thousand years? Well, again, Satan's bound. But you, the people will still be, the, the, you know, those that don't have their glorified bodies. Those people will still have the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life to deal with. And so because of that, some people are going to rebel simply because they are rebelling against the idea that Christ not only will rule over them, but that he has the right to do it. And they're going to bow up. I mean, that's just what it amounts to. Psalm 2. If you break down Psalm 2, you see this described very, very clearly. Uh, and, 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 and it starts, basically Psalm 2 starts with a discussion among the kings of the earth right before the battle of Armageddon, and then it, it takes you through through the millennium. Look at what it says. Psalm 2, verses 1 through four, or yeah, one through 6. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So when Christ comes back at the battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist and all the armies of the earth that are gathered together are not going to go, whoops, I guess we made a mistake. Instead, it's going to be a full-scale war. The only problem is they don't fire a shot. Christ speaks from the words of his mouth, and they all die. Okay? So that's this part. They're, you know, who is this that thinks he's going to rule over us? Now remember, that attitude, that same fleshly nature is going to carry into the kingdom. All right? So, verses 7 through 9. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. There's the millennial kingdom. Thou shalt break them with what? A rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So there's the millennial kingdom. Uh, that, that is part of Christ's inheritance. Okay, Then you come to the warning. In the latter part of chapter number 2, you have the warning for those who would, be cons who would consider rebelling. And this is what it says. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. 
Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish from the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. So you have the description of Him right before He comes back at the Battle of Armageddon. You have the description of the Millennial Kingdom being set up. And then you have the warning to the leaders of that day, don't do this if you're thinking about rebelling. So that kind of gives you an idea that while the earth itself, the physical earth itself, is in a near state of perfection, the human heart is still corrupted by the sin nature. And those who, like I said, those who are born during the millennial kingdom will still have that same sin nature as well. That's why when Satan is released a thousand years later, now imagine this for a minute, you have a near perfectly, a near perfect world where you want for nothing. You have a ruler who is literally ruling holy and righteous and just. No taking of bribes. No, every, He is judging exactly as it should be judged. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan is released and he stirs up almost virtually everybody who doesn't have that sin nature removed. All, those, all of us who uh, have uh, our glorified bodies, almost the entire earth that's there is going to rebel against him again. If that doesn't show you how corrupted our nature is, there's not much going to do it. Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and could pass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So Satan, and, and, and here's what you have to understand. When it's talking about here that Satan deceives them, he is not going to be deceiving himself or deceiving them as to who he is. He's going to present himself as the morning star. He's going to deceive them into believing that they can rebel this time and kick God off his throne. But he's not going to bother like he does now, disguising himself as an angel of light or anything else. Why? Because for a thousand years, there, the people that are on the earth are going to have gotten used to this idea of angels and glorified bodies and all of this kind of stuff. So he's not going to have to deceive himself as being anything other than what he is, an angel, a fallen angel. And the deception is going to be the message, not the messenger. Now he deceives by hiding who he is as the messenger, an angel of light, the serpent, whatever, you know, you know wherever and whatever you want to do in Scripture. During the, at the end of the millennium, he's not going to disguise himself at all. He's going to present himself as, I'm the one who can free you from that tyrant, and then I'll let you do whatever you want to do. And the whole earth is going to, all, uh, virtually the whole earth, is going to rally around him going, yeah, let's do it this time. So Christ will need to rule with a rod of iron because of the sin nature that people still have. Now, this, or, this takes away from the argument. You hear this today, especially in the social justice settings and, and everything else. You'll hear people make the statement that, you know, the problem is the environment. It's not the person. It's the environment. If they had everything they needed to take care of their needs, if they were raised in a better home, if they had a better support structure, if, 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 then what would happen is they would be just this nice, productive member of society. The millennium proves that a complete lie. You have a perfect ruler, a perfect government, in a near-perfect world where nobody has to want or need for anything, and yet at the end of that thousand years and during that thousand years, they will rebel against the one person who made all of that possible because they don't like the idea that he's the boss. So anybody that tells you all you got to do is put people in the right environment and all the problems will go away, hogwash. Don't happen. Sin nature prevents all of that from being true. So, as we said a moment ago, uh, the earth itself will return to an almost Eden-like condition. 
First, animals will no longer display ferocity, and it'll no longer be the rule of tooth and claw. Again, very familiar passage, Isaiah chapter 11. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice then. That's just another type of snake. Now, some have said, and you'll hear this sometimes, that these verses are about heaven. But there's all kinds of problems in that. But the ones who do say that usually go back there and say that's why there'll be animals in heaven. This ain't talking about heaven. The context is all about the millennial kingdom. So that's another, that's another discussion for another day. So uh, also a return to long life for those who enter the millennium uh, or the millennial kingdom will also occur and it will also be for any that are born during that time. Isaiah 65 verses 19 through 20, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people and the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days. In other words, no more infant deaths. Okay? Nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. If you die at a hundred years old, they're going to say, man, he was just a baby. But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Again, what this shows is that they're almost, it's almost back to like the Garden of Eden. Now, there'll still be some, there will still be some who will die. Like I said, the passage says that if they die at 100, it'll be like, you know, people will say, well, man, they died, they were just a kid, or, you know, they was just a baby, or whatever else. But there'll still be death during the millennial, but, millennial kingdom, but it's not like what we think of or see today. But think about this for a moment. This got a, I got to thinking about this, and I was like, wow. If people are about the same age, if they lived to about the same age as people before the flood, okay, or after the fall but before, and before the flood, if people live to that age, which goes back to dying at 100 years old, they'll die as a child. Look at these dates or ages. Adam, 930 years. Seth, 912 years. Enosh, 905. Canaan, 910. Mahalalel, 895, Jared, 962, Enoch, 365, he didn't die, he was translated, we know that. Uh, Methuselah, 969, Lamech, 777, that's because he died uh, before the flood. And then you've got Noah, who lived even after the flood, his total lifespan was 950 years. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. God extends the lifespans. But what this means is that maybe that first generation that's born during the millennial kingdom will still be living when Satan stirs them up again. Now you think about that. One generation. A lot of the people who were the first ones born in the millennial kingdom may very well still be living when Satan stirs up the rebellion and God destroys them again. So it would be all those people, plus all their kids, plus their grandkids, plus their great-great-kids, blah, 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 blah. But can you think about the fact that a 900-some-year-old person would still be living at the end of the millennium? That's pretty wild. Now, like I said, I had never really thought about that until I was studying and just kind of putting together thoughts about this. But again, they will have lived almost the entire millennial kingdom and they'll still want to rebel. Now, facilitating this long life will be the fact that many illnesses that are current in the world today will no longer exist. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. So not only will people live for hundreds of years, but the, a lot of illnesses will no longer be in existence either. Okay? The physical earth itself is also going to be impacted and changed. And again, there is a ton of verses about this, but I'm just going to give you a couple. Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. 
It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Even the deserts will become fruitful. All right? Uh, Amos 9, 13 through 15. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So the entire earth is going to become this veritable, uh, just producing wonder. Food, plants, anything that you need, the earth is going to bring forth abundantly again as part of the millennium. And this brings us to the question, and this is where one of the questions actually, the questions that was asked about the millennium came from. The question was, what about commerce during the millennium? Will there be a return to a one world commercial system? during the reign of Christ. Now remember, there's a one world commercial system at the, you know, during the tribulation. So when Christ rules and you know, he's ruling from Jerusalem, is it going to return to another single worldwide commercial system? And the answer is a qualified yes. Okay, It'll not be based, on, and, and this was part of the question, will, it, will they just build on the technology that they were already using during the millennium or during the tribulation? The answer to that question, I think, is no. Because the Bible says that the economic system uh, during the tribulation is completely destroyed in Revelation chapter 18, uh, verses 9 through 24. I'm not going to pull those up, but you can go read that. But in Revelation 18, nine, verses 9 through 24, the whole commercial system is completely and utterly destroyed. But during the millennium, there will be commerce. Ezekiel 45, verses 9 through 12, thus saith the Lord God, let it suffice you, O princes of Israel, remove violence and spoil and execute judgment and justice. Take away your exactions from my people, says the Lord God. Ye shall have, here it is, just balances and a just ephah and a just bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of one measure, that the bath may contain the tenth part of an omer, and the ephah the tenth part of an omer. <coughs> the measure thereof shall be after the omer, and the shekel shall be twenty geras, twenty shekels, five and twenty shekels, fifteen shekels shall be your manna or mina. Now, what that's saying is, when you, just to kind of break that down from a commerce standpoint, is that there will have to be accurate transactions and exchanges, okay? Uh, commodities are things like wheat, food, that kind of stuff. That's the ephahs, the baths, and the homers, or omers, which are container measurements. And in the cash transactions, that's the shekel, the gira, and the mina. So there's obviously going to be commerce going on. Because it says here that Christ is going to require just balances and just weights. The only reason that's a necessity is if there's commerce going on. So to answer the question, yes, there will be commerce. Okay? That's not a question. Secondly, values will be tightly regulated. Very specific. It will be this much and exactly this much and nothing more. Again, that's a sign of commerce. Three, attempts to defraud will be punished. Again, that's a sign of commerce. <laughs> so just in that one passage of Scripture, you see clearly that there will be commerce during the millennium. Exactly what it's going to look like, eh. <laughs> I can't tell you. There's not a whole lot about that other than the fact that it does exist. But here's the key. In many respects, the primary focus of the millennium will be on the worship of Christ. As a matter of fact, the book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48, tell us a great deal about the different aspects of worship during that time. Verses four, chapters 40 and 42 talk about the measurements of the temple complex. And I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. 43 tells us the glory of the Lord fills the temple. Chapter 44 discusses the Lord, the prince, and the priesthood. Chapter 45 covers the land allotments within uh, the complex. This is talking about within the, uh, the holy oblation. We'll talk about that in a second. Covers the worship, uh, 46, covers the worship, the sacrifices that are offered. And then chapters 47 and 48 talk about Israel's allotments within the portion. 
they get the land that God promised them all the way back to the time of Abraham. So Ezekiel 40 through 48 really dives into this, what will it be like to worship Christ during the millennium? And what you have to understand is that the land allotment for the Jews will go, and this is prophesied in two different, a couple of different places in Scripture, first off to Abraham, that the Jews' land will go from the Mediterranean Sea on the, on the west <laughs> all the way to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers on the east. Now, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers where Iran and Iraq are today, okay? So Israel's land will go all the way from the Mediterranean Sea, which is where they're at now, all the way into Iran and Iraq, okay? Now, as part of that, and there will be this huge allotment for David the prince, okay? And you can kind of see it in this diagram here, but here it is blown up. This right here, this square, 50 miles east to west, 50 miles, uh, or actually longer than that, you know, no, 50 miles uh, north to south. In that allotment, on this side of this all the way uh, to the Tigris and Euphrates River is the land for David the Prince. This 50 by 50 mile square is specific to the temple and the lands around it. Now what you have in the northern part of the first 20 miles, or the top 20 miles, is the land that's allotted for the Levites. That's the priestly tribe, okay? But if you'll notice in the center near the temple, around the temple, this map also shows you for the priests. Now the reason that's distinct is this. God promised Zadok during the time of David, David the, in, in the Old Testament, God promised Zadok that they would serve the Lord in that office continually because of their kindness to David. So now you have David the prince, you have the son of David ruling from the temple. And so this for the priests here is talking about the Zadoki, those, those that were part of the, of the line of Zadok, not Aaron. The line of Zadok will be the priests during the millennium. And then that last 10 miles, so that's 20 miles, 20 miles, the last 10 miles uh, and 10 by 50 is Jerusalem, is the new Jerusalem. Or not, oh, let me back up. Not the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 22. <laughs> this will be the Jerusalem during the millennium. I'll say it right in a minute. Uh, but it will be 10 miles by 50 miles across. It will go all the way from this holy oblation. This is what's reserved for Christ and the priesthood and everything else. And Jerusalem will be a part of that. But it'll be a 10 by 50 mile square. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you go back and you look at that. And you can see that all of this land, this square is what I just showed you. Everything from here to here is just for David the prince. Then you've got every tribe. Dan, Asher, Nophtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, Judah, Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad. The Levites don't have land. Why? They didn't have it before. They've got their portion in the Holy Oblation. Zadok is called out specifically in several different passages of Scripture, the line of Zadok, as being the priests who will wait on Christ during the millennium. Isn't that cool? I mean, just, just some of this. Now, there's all kinds of stuff about this. And like I said, I'm, I'm really just giving you a flavor, okay? And not even getting into the details. If you compare, and there is a chart of this one in your notes, if, uh, if you compare the temple complex in the millennium, that's this big square, all right? This is Herod's temple for scale. This is Herod's temple. This is Solomon's temple. This is the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that's a football field. And that's just the temple courtyard and the temple for the millennial kingdom. That is mind-blowing. When you read Ezekiel and it talks about the temple and the courtyard and all that kind of stuff, it talks about storage chambers, it talks about kitchens, it talks about the priest chambers, it talks about uh, different buildings, the gateways, the different gates that you go in and out. 
all of that kind of stuff, it goes into great detail so that you can actually kind of draw out maps and kind of figure out kind of where things are. They all look pretty much like this. They may, one of them may put a kitchen in another place or something like that, but overall, this is the, this is the view that you get, okay? And this is one artist's rendition of what just the temple complex here by itself would look like based on the description in Ezekiel. That is impressive. I mean, absolutely impressive. It, because all of this is just the courtyard, and that building right there is the temple, and it's that building right there where Christ will rule and reign for that thousand years. That's, that's wild. <laughs> and like I said, if you want to study Scripture, this, this is the part that where your, your brain kind of gets twisted trying to understand everything that it's actually telling you here. Now, the fact that the Bible speaks that the, of the fact that the, during the millennial kingdom, sacrifices are going to be offered again. Now, a lot of people have struggled with that for good reason. Because why are they offering sacrifices again in the millennium if Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice so that no more sacrifices have to be offered? That's the question. I mean, Hebrews chapter number 10, verses 1 through 14. For the law having a shadow and good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that, they worship, uh, that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me, to do thy will, O God, that's Christ. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldst not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said, he, then said he, Lo, I come, and do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. That's talking about the Old Testament versus the New Covenant. All right? By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them which are sanctified. So the question is, if Hebrews is so clear, that sacrifices are of no value now that Christ has, has paid the price as the ultimate sacrifice. Why, during the millennium, with Christ on the earth, do the sacrifices start back up? That's a good question. One I struggled with for a long time. <laughs> Just to be perfectly honest with you, for years and years. But I found this article that summarizes the, the position that I've got uh, it was just published in 2009, and I, I settled on this way, way back. But this was actually published in 2009 by Timothy Ice, who is a tremendous prophetic scholar. Uh, but he says this, These sacrifices provide ritual cleansing of the priests, sanctuary, and utensils. Now listen to what he says. Only Christ's sacrifice on the cross actually removes one's sin. Jerry Hollinger provides a solution that deals honestly with the text of Ezekiel and in no way demeans the work of Christ or what Christ did on the cross. This study suggests that animal sacrifices during the millennium will serve primarily to remove ceremonial uncleanness and prevent defilement from polluting the temple envisioned by Ezekiel. In other words, before somebody can enter into the temple complex, they offer the sacrifice at saying that they, uh, that they have purified themselves and confessed all their sins before they come in. Okay? This will be necessary because the glorious presence of Yahweh, or Christ, will once again be indwelling on earth in the midst of a sinful and unclean people. Because of God's promise to dwell on earth during the millennium, as stated in the New Covenant, it's necessary that He protects His presence through sacrifice. It should further be added that this, uh, that this sacrificial system will be a temporary one in that the millennium, with its partial population of unglorified humanity, that's the ones that are born into the kingdom or go into the kingdom that don't have glorified bodies, will only or last only 1,000 years. So this is just during the millennial kingdom. 
when you have sinful people interacting with a sinless God directly. Okay? Secondly, critics of future millennial sacrifices seem to assume that all sacrifices, past and future, always depict Christ's final sacrifice for sin. They do not. There were various purposes for sacrifices in the Bible. Many of the sacrifices under the Mosaic system were purification rituals. Many who take a literal interpretation of these sacrifices also believe that they will serve as a memorial to Christ's once-for-all atoning work. Uh, yet critics believe this to be a flawed conclusion. Support for a future memorial aspect can be seen in the fact that our current observations of the Lord's Supper includes this aspect. In other words, some of the sacrifices will be offered to show the people living at the time the awfulness of sin as a memorial, just like today we take the Lord's Supper to remember what Christ did for us on the cross. Okay, Although there will be millennial sacrifices, the focus of all worship will remain on the person and work of the Savior. The millennial temple and this ritual will serve as a daily reminder of fallen man's need before a holy God and lessons about how this same God lovingly works to remove the obstacle of human sin for those who trust him. So it's a memorial or an object lesson to let us know just how much sin costs, as well as a way to purify people before they enter the holy of holies, basically, by entering into the temple complex. Does that make sense? Like I said, years ago, I finally came to that conclusion. <laughs> and I was so glad when I was doing research for this to find this article. It goes like that it dates back to 2009. But it summarized everything that I had come to in my own study. So I, it was easier just to quote him because uh, I like Timothy Ice uh, and Randall Price both. They're great prophecy scholars. All right. Questions or comments? That's a really, really, really brief overview of the millennium. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? Okay. Do you want to talk about the resurrection of the Old Testament saints? Aaron, pull it up. <laughs> We're going to talk about this again briefly. Uh, but the question is, and I came across this as I was studying for the millennial kingdom, is when are the Old Testament saints resurrected? Now, it's a really interesting question. And really, I'll be honest with you, I had just kind of assumed something based on things that I had been taught and everything else until I came to this and started studying it. And the assumption is based on Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, of course, this is talking about Christ. Now that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. When Christ died on the cross, he spent the three days in the grave, and the Bible tells us he ascended. Or, uh, you know, he uh, went back to heaven after the 40 days. And the Bible also tells us that when he did that, he took the paradise section that it talks about in Luke chapter number 16. Uh, that, you know, there was paradise and hell. There was a great gulf between them that, you know, he went to hell and preached. He, he didn't go to the hell with the burning side. He went to the paradise side and showed himself for who he is and all of this kind of stuff. And then when he ascended, he took captivity captive. Now, from my, my whole life, what I have heard is that because he took captivity captive when he did, that when he comes back at the rapture resurrection, all of the Old Testament saints will be resurrected at the same time as all the New Testament saints. I've heard that my whole life. That, you know, they'll all be sitting around the uh, uh, marriage supper of the Lamb eating with us and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so that's, you know, that's, like I said, that's the assumption. That's what I'd always heard. And, but as I've studied <laughs> some key scriptures, because like I said, I saw something that kind of got my attention, and so I started really digging into this. The Scripture teaches as well that the Old Testament or the Old Testament saints will not be resurrected until the time period right at the millennium. What Scriptures do I mean? Well, first off, we know that the Old Testament saints believed in a resurrection. You don't see it taught necessarily like you see it taught in the New Testament. But you see that the Old Testament saints already believe this. Why? Job. Remember, Job is considered to be one of the oldest records back in time, probably lives about the time of Abraham, that we have. Okay? This is what Job said. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. 
So he says, I'm going to die, I'm going to go to the grave, the worm's going to eat my flesh, but there's coming a day when I'm going to stand before him again in my flesh. So that's resurrection. Same thing Isaiah 26, 19. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead bodies shall they rise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So again, the Old Testament teaches this idea of an Old Testament resurrection of saints, but it's just not formalized like you read in 1 Corinthians 15 or something like that. You do, but you do find it throughout the Scripture. Now, uh, as, you, as you continue on, there's a past... Now, remember also, the Pharisees in Christ's day who were teaching the traditions that they had received going all the way back into Old Testament times, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, but the Sadducees didn't. If you go to... Acts 23 and verse number 8, it specifically says that. So even the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. All right? So there's a passage, though, in Daniel chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2, that seems to indicate that the Old Testament saints don't resurrect until after the horrors of the tribulation. Here it is. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, being Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble. Anytime you read that in, in relation to prophecy, in relation to Israel, it's talking about the tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's called the time of great misery. There's all kinds of different terms, but this is one of them. A time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, the people shall be delivered. And the phrasing there in the Hebrew is, is after that time. Okay? At that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. There's your resurrection, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So Daniel seems to portray the fact that the Old Testament saints resurrect after the tribulation, not before, which is what happens to the saints. All right? The New Testament, and like I said, this is the passage of Scripture that really made me rethink my position. <laughs> I just had not thought about it very well up until this point. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now here's the question. Are the Old Testament saints considered dead in Christ? And the answer to that question is no. To be in Christ is a technical term. And it goes back to what happens to a saint, a sinner, excuse me, when they accept Christ as Savior. The Bible says in Romans that that person is baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. Okay? That is a technical term reserved only for those who have accepted Christ as Savior. All right? The expression in Christ is a technical theological description of Christians who are baptized by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. This baptism places Christians into Christ and, in his, and into his body, the church. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about, again, th th those who are the first fruits, those who have believed in Christ. It doesn't talk about the Old Testament saints. Okay? So, question that comes up then from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, is it says that, and I'll just back it up, it's, it sounds like that, some, that when the resurrection happens, some are raised to everlasting life, some immediately are judged in damnation. Now we know from the New Testament that that judgment to damnation doesn't happen until after the millennium, right? So, how do you reconcile this? Well, it's because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets saw both Christ's first coming and second coming at the same, and they saw it as if it was the same time, okay? We know that from uh, Isaiah 61, 4. Here's the first coming, and Christ actually quoted this in Luke 4, 16 through 19, and he stops at the, end, at the beginning of verse number 2 when he quotes this in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Christ gets right there, and then he closes the book of Isaiah, and he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Right? So this is the first coming. But the verse continues, and he didn't read that. And the day of vengeance of our God. <laughs> That's the tribulation. That's the judgment of the nations. To comfort all that mourn, to appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Remember, at the end of the tribulation, Christ comes back, obviously, at the battle of Armageddon, and then we've said he deals with Israel for 30 days. And he gives comfort to those that mourn, beauty for ashes, all of this kind of stuff at that time, and then the millennial kingdom starts up. So they saw... Um, Isaiah saw here both the first coming and the second coming, and he wrote it as if it was a simultaneous event, even though there's a gap. And we know the gap between the first and second coming is the church age. Right? All right, so that's the gap. So it's like you got a mountain here and a valley and a mountain. You got the, the mountain over here is the first coming, the mountain over here is the second coming, and you got the church age by here, and they're looking this way, and so what they saw was the two comings. Same thing's true here. You've got the resurrection of the just at the beginning of the millennium. And you've got the resurrection of the unjust at the end of the millennium. That's Daniel chapter number 12, verse number 2. And between this one and that one is the valley of the millennial kingdom itself. Does that make sense? Same exact thing. So he's not saying this happens simultaneously. This is how Daniel saw it because he didn't see the millennium in this particular uh, teaching or this particular vision of the resurrection. Uh, if you go to Isaiah 53, by the way, I may say that a minute ago. <laughs> I got to hit myself. If you go to Isaiah 53, which is that famous passage, you know, he, he bore our iniquities, that passage. Verses 1 through 9 of Isaiah 53 is the first coming. Then verses twelve or verses ten and twelve or ten through twelve is the second coming. Same passage of scripture reads just like a complete thing, but you can see the line based on what happened between the first and the second. So, uh, Revelation chapter twenty and verse number four talks about there, and I'll just, I'll just, I don't think I put that on there. No, um, Revelation chapter number twenty and verse number four talks about those who are resurrected at the very beginning of the millennium who did not accept the mark of the beast. Uh, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither his received his mark under their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's their resurrection. So what that basically says is, is that somehow about the same time that happens, the Old Testament saints will be resurrected as well. Does that make sense? I know that's really fast. But the answer to the question is, is when are the Old Testament saints resurrected? Scripture seems to indicate they're resurrected. The Old Testament saints aren't resurrected until the beginning of the kingdom. Which actually makes sense, considering that's the thing they were looking for, was their Messiah and the kingdom. And then... Everything else plays out like it does. Isn't that kind of cool? And like I said, for, I'm, I'm 50, let's see, 99, 99, I'm 53. <laughs> and if that don't tell you that I'm getting there. <laughs> but literally, my whole life, I had been told, you know, Ephesians 4, they take captivity captive, they all come back together. And I don't think that's what Scripture teaches. I think if you look at Daniel 12, and you look at some, and there's other scriptures, but I think specifically that one, and then you go to the New Testament when it says it's the dead in Christ that rise, it indicates that the Old Testament saints don't come out of the earth, don't come out of the ground, until it's right at the time of the millennium. Now, what's interesting about that, and Sabrina can attest to this, in Jerusalem, there is a graveyard right outside of the Eastern Gate. If you've ever seen a picture of the Eastern Gate, you'll see all these little white sarcophagi all over the side of the mountain. If you're wealthy, well-respected, 
or got connections, you get buried on the Eastern Gate side. Why? Because according to Jewish tradition, when Messiah comes, he will walk through the Eastern Gate, and as he walks through the Eastern Gate, the dead, the holy dead, will rise up around him as he's entering into the city. So even they believe, even though they don't believe in, in the church age and all this other kind of stuff, they do believe that the resurrection will occur when the Messiah comes into his kingdom. And that's Jewish. Pretty cool. <laughs> that's, that's just all I can say. It's just pretty cool. Questions or comments? And like I said, I did a lot of research on this. Brother Mike came in on Monday, uh, this past Monday, and he said, you don't need more looking at that. <laughs> and I said, not a whole lot. He said, he said, I have. And he and he starts rattling off all these people that's saying the same thing, basically. And uh, and and so I'm sitting there going, Well, yeah, I said, I've got to look at it if I get a few minutes. And so I actually had a chance to dig into it. And the more I dug into it, the more convinced I became that this really does happen at the end of the tribulation, or the very beginning of the millennium. Now, you know, I'm not going to split hairs. Does it happen during that 30 days that he's dealing with Israel? Does it happen before that? Does it happen right after that? Does it happen when he takes down the tower, abomination of desolation? I don't know. All I know is, is that it's going to happen right at the beginning of the millennium, give or take 45 days <laughs> or 75 days. That's about, all, it's about the best I can do. But I think it's going to be in that time frame. Questions or comments? <laughs> No. And see, and that's what I said last week, and I said it a little bit even today, is that it's, it's, it's sad that there's not more teaching about the millennium because it is so much of the Old Testament prophecy, and it impacts who we are as believers because, like I said, we're the ones who are ruling and reigning with him. And, oh, Really? And, and, and so I've done a little bit of it. I mean, like I said, I was stupid, 19 years old. The guy that was teaching the teen Sunday school class at Mount Vernon said, uh, hey, he said, uh, I've always wanted to hear somebody teach the book of Revelation. Why don't you tackle that? Now, this was before I even, got, this was before I even announced my call to preach. I had filled in for him a few times while he was traveling, and he came and sat in on a couple that I taught in addition to that. And he said, I've always wanted to hear somebody teach on that. He said, why don't you tackle Revelation? I was just stupid enough and young enough. I thought, okay. Boy, I'm telling you what, did I, t uh, did I bite off something? And so, but I learned more about the Old Testament. And I say that, I learned more about the Old Testament so in the book of Revelation than I'd ever learned in my life. Because you have to understand what's going on in the Old Testament to understand what's going on in the New. And part of that was the study of the millennium. And so that was my first exposure to this. And I was like, and I was 19. And that was the first time I'd ever even heard of the millennial kingdom. And so I'm sitting here looking at this stuff going, this is crazy. And just trying to connect the dots, I was drawing maps. Sabrina will tell you, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler, but if you give me a map, I can pretty much trace one out. And so I was drawing maps, and we were plastering stuff up on the boards and, and, and on the walls and, and all of this kind of stuff. But that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody talk about the millennium. And so, and then like I said, even with all of that, I mean, that's been 30 years, 33, 34 years. And I've studied prophecy for, over and over again, different aspects and parts and pieces. But this was the first time I'd ever come across that about the Old Testament saints not resurrecting until the millennium. And I don't know how, you know, I don't know what I missed when I was reading or if it just wasn't covered in the books I had at the time or what. But anyway, yes, ma'am. Okay. Which verse five? Yeah. Yes. Okay, hang on. Let me go over here and see. <laughs> uh, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished that's the, un, that's the lost the unsaved dead that's the millennium that, that happens at the end of the millennium at the great white throne judgment thank you yes sir yes sir right it might, I mean, I think basically everybody, and this is the question for those of you that are watching via live stream, 
uh, in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, is this talking, uh, it talks about the souls under the altar. Is this the Old Testament saints and those 144,000, or is it just the 144,000? I've only seen it referred to, or uh, seen this referred to as those of the 144,000, okay? Um, I've not done a lot of digging in it to see. Uh, it, it might be another indicator if I do a little bit more digging on it, but the, the only thing I've ever seen it referred to as is the 144,000, but that's all I can say. I'm not saying it's not. I just, just all I've ever seen. Brother Paul, do you have a question? Brother Paul, I thought I saw you raise your... Oh, you're just pointing at him? Okay. <laughs> Point at Brother Baker. Somebody else? Somebody else? Yes. I mean, but, you know, the, yeah, these, are the, the, these seals, and I... And, I don't know if you were here when I talked about the seals or not, that the seals are not judgments themselves. And, and most people, I, and this is Timology to some degree, but I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to back this one up <laughs> with people here and, and everywhere else. But the six seals in Revelation chapter number six uh, are basically the previews before the movie. That's how you get, you know, like if you've ever seen a movie preview, you know what I'm talking about. They'll show you this, and then they'll show you that, and then they'll show you this to get you interested in what's coming. That's kind of what the seals are because it makes no sense if this early, for instance, and I'll just use this as the example, if by the sixth seal, which is, would be according to most people who talk about the seals, the trumpets, and the vials, the sixth seal would be extremely early in the, rebel, in, the, in the tribulation because you've still got the seven uh, trumpets, you've still got the seven seals. But in chapter number six, talking about that sixth seal, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and though there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. So this land was like, I mean, this is major. And then it says, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? If this is chronological and it's six seals, six trumpets, six vials, then by the sixth seal, the entire world recognizes that it's Christ who's judging them. And if you read the rest of the book of Revelation, that's not what happens. So the six seals are actually, the, the, the judgment is in that scroll. First seal pops off. You see the Antichrist in his peaceful stage. Second seal pops off. You see him waging war. Third seal page pops off. You see the famine and everything that's going to result as a result of all of the judgments. The fourth, you see this. The fifth, you see the judgment of the souls. Those 144,000 that are killed during the, during the tribulation period. And then the sixth seal is all of the physical changes to the earth because of all of these judgments like wormwood and all the other stuff. Does that make sense? Now that's a real quick, dirty version of that. I taught it in more detail a while back. <laughs> but, but that's the quick and dirty version. Which again goes back to saying these are probably the 144,000. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so that's, again, it's, the time, it's a time thing all the way around. That's why I think the six seals, and, then, and then that also explains, if you go to chapter 8, which is when the seventh seal is taken off in chapter number 8, and when he had opened the seventh seal, so now the scroll's open, right? And there's silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. The judgment's about to begin. That's why there's silence in heaven for that half hour. Okay? Thank you, brother. Somebody else? Amazing stuff. But that wraps up the prophecy side of things. Lord willing, starting next week, as we're looking at standing on solid ground, how to apply the Bible to everyday events, 
we are going to begin our look at climate change and, envi and radical environmentalism. How do we as Christians deal with it and explain it to people? Or what's the stand that we need to take? Especially considering there are a lot of people who will tell you that it's Christians' fault that we have global warming to begin with. So how do we deal with that? How do we answer it? What does the science, what do they say the science says? What does the science really show? Uh, if, I could, if I can work it out, uh, I'm, my plan is to introduce it next week, and we'll talk about just climate change, radical environmentalism, you know, do animals deserve the same rights as people, uh, you know, uh, all, of the, all the stuff that ties up to radical environmentalism. I'll kind of introduce that, and then if I can work it out with him, a, good, a dear friend of mine, he's been here before, Dr. Alan White, uh, that I used to work with at Eastman, he has written extensively for Answers in Genesis and other ministries. Uh, he has written extensively about climate change, and he and I have co-taught some of this before. So what I'm hoping to do is introduce it next week, have Alan come in the next week and kind of give his spiel, and then I'll build on that from there. Uh, if I can get Dr. Allen in here, he's a, he, like I said, he's a dear friend. We've known each other for many, many years and uh, worked together at Eastman, was in a Bible study together at Eastman. That's how we actually met. And, uh, but he is very knowledgeable, has done a lot of writing for Answers in Genesis. Matter of fact, they've got the books they call the Answers books, one, two, three, and four, if you've ever been on their website, uh, into the bookstore. And all of the articles, I think, on climate change in those books are written by him. I mean, he's, he knows his stuff. Like I said, he's a dear friend. He lives here in Kingsport. <laughs> so I'm hoping to get him to come and uh, help me kick this thing off. We did it once before. We actually did it when we did it at Emmanuel. Um, I introduced it in Sunday school, and he got Sunday morning. And, man, it was good. And that's been a few years ago, so I know he's got a lot better day than now than we had even then. So looking forward to it. Comments or questions? Comments or questions? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we've got one other thing we need to do. But Aaron, after we close out with prayer, you can turn us off, all right? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity that we have to come to you and study your work. I pray that you'd just continue to have your way and help us as we continue to study. I've uh, got a few more topics that you've burdened our hearts with or people have asked questions about that we're going to deal with in the uh, weeks ahead. So I pray that you'd just allow me to share what you burden my heart with, give me the ability to retain the things from all the different sources, and Father, we'd see you just do great and mighty things. We love you, and we give you the praise for all that you're going to do. We ask it in Jesus' name.